Okay, let's move on with more boring DIY 3D printer design considerations. I do admit I ended the last episode rather abruptly, you might say, just because the 10 minute mark was reached and I hadn't even covered half of what I wanted to cover, so if I had done everything in one take, the video would probably have ended up like 30 minutes long or something, and I have the impression people don't like to watch long videos. But that being said, I told you I was going in depth on this 3D printer, and that is exactly what we're going to do. And going in depth does not always mean making flashy videos, it also means talking about things some people might consider boring. But that's just the way life is. We need to do some boring stuff sometimes because there are enough flashy 3D printer videos on YouTube. So, what I actually wanted to say in the last episode, the next thing we were going to talk about before I said holy shit, was the first thing I need to change about this design. So yeah, that is a big deal. So if you look down here, we have a gear reduction in the Z-axis. And I actually decided there is no need for gear reduction because I have enough precision with the lead screws already. I don't need a gear reduction in the Z-axis. That would just make everything way too slow, you see? Because the pitch on these M5 threaded rods is already very narrow as is, so you need a lot of rotation to move the, the nut by one millimeter. So by having a gear reduction down here, well, it just ain't gonna happen. It'll take way too long to wind the x-axis all the way up and all the way down. It'll take way too long. So let me quickly explain why I originally thought I'm going to put the gear reduction in here. I only have one stepper motor controlling both of the z-axis lead screws. This is very important because using salvage stepper motors, I don't have two stepper motors of the same model. They are all different. Well, actually, I do have two similar stepper motors. These came out of an electronic typewriter, but I'm going to use these for the X and the Y axes. Um, I'm gonna go into a lot more detail on the stepper motors in a separate Selecting the Stepper Motor episode, but long story short, the timing belt I'm going to use to link these two Z-axis lead screws was salvaged out of an old flatbed scanner along with this gear reduction and its own stepper motor. Now, I'm not going to use this stepper motor on the Z-axis because this stepper motor is probably too weak, it's not very big, but I have a bigger one and my idea was just to take this stepper motor out of there and put the bigger one in using this gear reduction because I actually don't know the pitch of this timing belt. There is a few things written on there, but I couldn't come up with anything reasonable typing that into Google. So I thought easier than finding out the pitch of the timing belt, I could just use the gear reduction that came with it, so I already have the perfect pulley to drive the belt. But I recently decided that using this gear reduction would just make things a lot more inconvenient by making it slower to wind all the way up and all the way down. Plus, as you can see here, my approach of attaching this gear reduction, this metal plate with the gears on it, that was in the scanner, my approach of attaching this was, well, rather sketchy, you might say. I mean, this is obviously a pretty bad job I did there, just putting it in slightly rotated by a few degrees. It is not a good solution putting this gear reduction in here like that. And also this very inappropriately shaped part, this should be removed. Well, I'm probably not going to be able to remove it completely because I need to tension the belt. Um, so, unfortunately, it'll probably have to stay. Although, I might make it less inappropriately shaped. That would be good. Yeah. Now, about the X and the Y axes, they both also have a gear reduction, but I'm going to talk about that in the stepper motor episode. Not now. <clears throat> Next up, we have a little issue with the print bed. Now, the print bed is a very difficult thing because it's a pane of glass from an inkjet printer and it'll have to be attached to the wooden frame. And also, it's a heated bed. It'll be fuming. This 
pane of glass is going to be heated up to like 120 degrees Celsius or something and attaching it to the wooden print bed is a pretty good challenge. So the way I decided to do that was by making these fancy shaped metal brackets. Now these are going to be a pretty good challenge to fabricate because yeah, they are pretty complicated as you can see. You have this piece of sheet metal bent around several corners and then I somehow need to attach a piece of threaded rod or something or a screw to this piece of sheet metal. And usually, industrially, you would just either spot weld it on or just riveted it on, but I neither have a spot welder nor some kind of tool to rivet threaded rods, so I think I'm going, well, I'm gonna talk about that in the specific episode where we're going to build these metal things, but the problem I have with the heated bed is, obviously, as you can see, the pane of glass is smaller than the wooden frame underneath, and I think, well, it's only my personal opinion, but in my opinion this looks very unprofessional to have the tabletop smaller than the actual structural frame underneath the table. So what I want to do is make these metal brackets a little bigger to move the threaded rod further in, further towards the center of the glass plate, so then I can take a strip off the MDF frame and make it at least the same size as the heated bed pane of glass. That would be a good thing. And as you might also have noticed, on this 3D printer there is no aluminum plate underneath the pane of glass. And that is because, well, an aluminum plate this size and thickness would have already blown my budget for the entire printer. So since I don't have an aluminum plate this size and thickness laying around, there is not going to be any aluminum plate. I'm just gonna do it without an aluminum plate. So the way to spread the heat more evenly without an aluminum plate is just to use more heating element. Plaster the entire underside of the heated bed with heating element. That is about what I'm going to try to do. It probably won't be the best heated bed you've ever seen, but it'll be good enough, I think. I just need to put the heating wire as close together as humanly possible so there is enough heat spreading between the wires that I don't need an aluminum plate. That is at least my plan. And the last issue, well, for now the last issue, I don't know if maybe I'm going to change things up again after that, but the next thing is here, as you can see on the x-axis, well, there is going to be this piece of fishing line running across to replace my timing belt. I actually have ordered another set of fishing line here, this is a thinner one, because the first one I ordered was 0.5mm variety with 49 strands, but they sent me the one with only 7 strands, and this one is a little too stiff, because it needs to wrap around the gear here. The 0.5mm one is too thick, so I ordered a thinner one, this one is nylon coated, stainless steel fishing line, it is 0.28mm thick, capable of holding up to 10 pounds, should be enough. I think. So this is going to be tensioned from one side of the x-axis to the other and as you can see there is a little problem because this tension is going to try and bend the x-axis rail like this. It's going to try to bow the x-axis rail because there's only tension on one side. Usually like on the standard Ender 3 you have the timing belt. That is actually very good design on the Ender 3. Having the timing belt running inside the aluminum extrusion and all the tension is taken up directly like this, there is no way the timing belt is going to try to bend the aluminum extrusion on the Ender 3, at least I think so. That is a very good design, however unfortunately I couldn't really do that on here because, well, it's a solid rail. What I'm actually thinking of doing is to make the rail not solid anymore, cut a little groove in the middle here lengthwise and put the fishing line inside the groove. So that would eliminate the problem of the tension of the fishing line trying to bend the x-axis. Now another solution to solve that problem would be to just make the fishing line go around two corners on the other side and go all the way back on the back side of the rail here. 
So there's equal tension on both sides of the x-axis and nothing tries to pull the x-axis crooked. However, I much more consider cutting a little dado lengthwise into the x-axis rail and just putting the fishing line inside of the x-axis rail, just like on the Ender 3. It probably won't be centered, I mean I would have to cut the x-axis almost all the way through, this is only 18 millimeters thick here. If I tried to put the fishing line right in the middle of that, I would probably end up cutting pretty much all the way through, which is not good because there is in fact tension on the x-axis from above and below. I think Cutting a little dado in it lengthwise and just making the fishing line at least flush with the surface should eliminate a lot of problems. As you can see, I did already try to put it as close as possible to the x-axis rail. If I measure this, 5 millimeters between the fishing line and the wood. So it's very close, as close as possible obviously, because you don't want a lot of leverage to bend the x-axis. I put it as close as possible, but I think it's better to put it inside the x-axis. So yeah, that's about everything I can think of having to change about right now. Of course, I may change my mind further down the line and do things entirely differently again. But for now, I think, yeah, removing the gear reduction down here changing the print bed so the pane of glass is actually the same size as the frame down here, as well as moving the fishing line inside of the x-axis rail should be the first three things I need to change right now. Everything else I think is more or less okay. So let's just change all these things right now while we're at it and then after that I'm going to walk you through all the changes I made and we'll wrap up the video. If I don't add another 10-20 minutes of talking afterwards then we'll call it one episode even if it ends up like 20 minutes long.